I, I want to start by um, just reminding folks of the principles of Emmaus ministry and, and what we do and why we do it. Um, first of all, uh, it is our desire, uh, our mission to foster ministering to and with LGBTQ individuals and their families in and adjacent to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And two principles that are really sort of guiding us in the work that we do is, first of all, that we, we want to enter in by the gate. Um, we want to work with priesthood uh, leadership and authority in the various wards and stakes where we reside. Um, we want to work in harmony with principles of the gospel and and we want to, to work with members and leaders of the church. Um, second principle is that we believe that it is absolutely essential that we create spaces in which LGBTQ individuals are able to affirm themselves and come to an understanding of themselves in their sexual and gender diversity, and that their identity as LGBTQ people can coexist with their faith and their spirituality as Latter-day Saints. And so often we see a divide that is so damaging. Um, and <clears throat> we want to foster a space in which that divide doesn't exist um, and where we can, where we can experience uh, a connection between who we are um, as LGBTQ individuals and who we are as children of God and disciples of Jesus Christ. So tonight we're really thrilled and excited to have a focus uh, for this evening's devotional on uh, trans individuals um, and their experience uh, in our wards and stakes and the ways, what we need to do uh, to better minister to and with um, trans individuals and their families. Um, and we have some wonderful speakers here, uh, Serena Jameson, uh, who is, has been active in the church in the Chicago area. And um, she's here with um, her former bishop and former stake president, uh, Brent Smith, and, uh, with, and his wife, Amy. Um, and so we're gonna start by hearing from Serena. And then we're gonna break up into some small groups and have some discussion. Uh, depending on how many of us uh, there are, we may break up into uh, two groups or three groups and have some discussion about some of the issues that, that um, we think are important to discuss related to ministering. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from um, President Smith and he'll share some thoughts and comments at the end. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a prayer um, to invite uh, the spirit here. And uh, Carson Perez, I'm wondering if you would be willing to offer an opening prayer. I'd love to. Thank you, John. Thank you. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, we thank thee for this opportunity to gather as siblings in Christ, to worship thee, uh, to hear from thy children who... Um, will share their stories about what it means uh, to be transgender in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are so grateful to thee for all of thy blessings on this Sabbath day. And we pray that thy spirit will help us to hear thy voice, help us to have open minds, open hearts, Guide us in thought, word, and deed, Father, that we might do thy will and love thee with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths, and, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray that thou wilt continue to strengthen LGBTQ folks in and adjacent to the church. And we continue to pray for further revelation regarding LGBTQ people with with thine anointed ones. We love thee, we worship thee, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
Okay, then. Thank you, Carson. So uh, before we get into the substance, uh, we're going to have a brief musical number that we hope will help invite the spirit here. And uh, it's going to be a song pre-recorded by Andrea Morgan Egg. Thank you. All right, Serena, I would like to turn the time over to you and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very kindly, John. Um, I appreciate having this space to discuss and thank you for the invita invitation. Going back many years, I knew I was in disharmony. I'd followed the one path and checked the boxes that I was told would bring me all the happiness I could ever want. I achieved in school and went on to get a college degree. I forged a connection with an amazing person who had become my spouse. I was introduced to the LDS church and was baptized. We married soon after and started our family almost immediately. And I settled down to the role that I'd always been assigned to, that of father, priesthood holder, and provider. I laid so many layers over this disharmony, trying to find the layer that would snuff it out. One of these many layers would hold the key to this, right? Could I finally find that happiness that others seemed so able to achieve in their own lives? rather than the struggle that I felt on a day-to-day -day basis just to keep moving forward. There was a truth that underlay all of this, a truth that I did not want to let out of the box in any way, shape, or form, that I was not really the gender that I was assigned at birth. I did not want to come to that conclusion. It scared me in so many ways, the marriage I established, the family I built, the extended family that I started my life with, my job, all the outside world suggestions that I would be less of a person, the discrimination and challenges with medical care and public law, and of course, the church I joined as a 19-year-old convert. In November of 2019, I had a crisis point. I had engaged a therapist through my workplace. Uh, with her assistance, I found enough courage to allow the barest pieces of Serena to come into the light of day. I do not believe that this would have happened successfully through the LDS church. I feel that my resolution of self could not have happened through consultation with any of the leaders or spiritual advisors of the LDS church, or even with any counselors that may be church aligned. While recently the LDS church started a more sophisticated way to minister to people who are transgender, to a newly out person, these materials seem meant for people who had already come to this conclusion, not ones who are in the process of working through their challenges with identity and gender. 
As a result, the first few months of my coming out process happened very independently of the church. Another aspect of this was that following my declaration of self and my emerging from the closet, I felt that I was unclean still being within the LDS church. I wondered if the celestial kingdom of heaven would be permanently closed to me. I came out before the church made changes to the way that they treated transgender people, and I knew that they had taken very dim views of LGBTQ plus people in the past. Who could reassure me that being transgender was not equivalent to a dozen figurative deaths? Those of my family, my marriage, my employment, my extended family, my friends, my church membership, and moreover, my failing relationship with my heavenly parents, who I thought I could never return to as a result. However, I could not possibly deny my truth any longer. Please think of the balance of the negativity and what had be going on inside my own head for me to finally say, okay, with all of that, yes, I am transgender and I'm going to start this process. I want to be whole and find my own joy in this world. I freely admit that I thought I couldn't possibly receive any sort of revelation or anything else that could help me in this decision. There were so many messages from all churches, much less just the LDS church, that being transgender was sinful and wrong. The one thing that I can remember was the immense and profound feeling of peace that settled upon me when I finally expressed my truth out loud publicly to my therapist almost two years ago to this day. I finally found my harmony and my soul resonated with it. I truly hope that this was my confirmation from upon high. So I'd come out. What did this mean for my future involvement in the LDS church? I did not know. I hadn't the slightest idea what it would mean for even my day-to-day -day life, much less the church. And at this point, as I dealt with being transgender, church was a once a week thing that ended up becoming maybe if we felt like it. My spouse was the first one that found any comfort from the church. Within about a couple months after I'd come out to her, she asked me if she could have a friend from the church that knew about the situation, so that she could have someone to talk to. I agreed because I felt that this would help her and then us in the long run. While I was glad that she had an outlet, I still felt that I couldn't trust a single person from the church with any of this. A couple months after this, the, the decision was made for me. As far as I could tell, this helpful sister ended up speaking with the Bishop of our ward, our second speaker, current stake president, Brent, Brent Smith. He wanted to then arrange a meeting between himself, my spouse, and me. I was pretty much horrified. I still wasn't out in any real way. I thought that I'd end up getting sanctioned or possibly completely removed from the church, especially when the details of the meeting, much less the mood of the leader himself, weren't clear to me. I knew that President Smith was in a uh, position of power to act by the church. He gives and withdraws callings, handles finances, provides temple recommends, and so he has authority. And I knew that what I was doing was not approved by the church. This authority really scared me as a person who could have so many bad outcomes. I believe that the exercise of authority should be as transparent as possible. And if it is not, it can be very frightening because there are so many possible outcomes rather than something that can be understood. At its base, exercising authority is applying power to others. As a result, I questioned whether or not it was safe for me to stay. In Mark chapter 2, uh, verses 15 through 17, Jesus is describing ta described taking a meal. It states, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. I did not know if the attitude of my leadership was to sit with the sinners and the publicans. It is the ideal that our leadership would follow Jesus's example. As well, I thought to myself, I'm not sinning just because I'm transgender. I certainly feel so much better having finally acknowledged this, and I feel so much more peace and joy in my path. Jesus made it clear in subsequent verses that all are sinners. Witness the responses he gave, he gave to the accusers of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. When he says, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone in verse 7, all of the accusers had looked through their own hearts and knew that they had sinned. Looking back, it took me some time to understand that it is up to my heavenly parents to judge me, not my bishop. It is up to my bishop to have fellowship with all who want it. At the time, though, I knew that others in my situation have had challenges with authority figures who were not sympathetic, who did not show love. So I did not want to deal with this possible challenge at this time. However, I pulled together my courage and I walked into that meeting with my spouse. The meeting started with a testimony from President Smith when he told me that I was still loved and that he would do my, his best to make sure that the church building itself was going to be a place where I felt comfortable. I felt more relieved at this point. After this, he did warn me that there would be sanctions. These included my ability to serve callings and my temple attendance, as well as removal of my priesthood. 
The temple is a bit of a complex topic. I went exactly once in my life from my ceiling to my spouse and my kids. And in order to go, I had to do my level best, level best to play a role that was incredibly uncomfortable to me. Once I entered, I did not feel as if I should have been there because of this. I could not find peace. And I had an overall negative experience. I literally felt that if the spirit was truly talking to the temple workers that day, they should have asked me why I was there. They did not. And my disharmony persisted. I'm glad for the work that was done in the temple and happy that it was done. But when I was told I could never go back, it did not leave me unhappy. I'd also like to admit I never felt comfortable with the priesthood portion of my responsibilities within the church. It is very similar to what I described that I was really shocked that I was allowed to do such things that I never really felt as if I could connect or commune with the Holy Spirit as I should have. That I always had this really bizarre filter between myself and heaven. I don't know if other priesthood holders ever had such levels of insecurity, but none ever admitted to me. Lastly, my bishop reminded me of the various things that leadership in Salt Lake have said about transgender people. In the greatest respect that I can offer, I do not know the many challenges that these men have faced in their lives. I don't know if they've ever fought the battles that I've had to fight. I only know the challenges that I face in my own life. I felt that their words had zero bearing on my day-to-day -day existence. I wanted to be me. I also know that at this point in their parlance, I will have placed my life into my heavenly parents' hands and that they would do with me what they will once I reach the eternities. And until that point, I feel like I may be able to have the joy that others get to experience with so much more consistency. Within a couple of short weeks of this meeting, quarantine happened. I bitterly hate the virus and all of the resulting chaos and grief that it has spread across the world. The quarantine has been a very isolating event and continues in many places. It keeps people away from other people. The quarantine also allowed me to not be quite so scared with starting to manifest myself, to bring Serena out into the world more. And with church being suspended, I didn't have to put a ton of thought into how I would go to church. It was just, it just wasn't there. This gave me some time and space to do what I needed to find harmony and joy, even in the middle of quite a bit of upheaval. There were online services, and at the time, I still received email requests to come to Elders Quorum. I spoke again with um, President Smith and made it perfectly clear to him that I would not attend Elders Quorum at any time in the rest of my lifetime. Despite this message, the emails did not stop. I also said that I would not attend Relief Society until two things happened, that I would be invited to do so by leadership and that my spouse would be fine with it too. When I and my family moved into our previous ward in March of 2013, I looked like a 280 pound man. This image was reinforced week after week after week. While I'd lost a lot of weight, it's hard to shake th uh, that image from someone's mind. And the last thing I wanted to do is disinvite the spirit into a place that I would not be welcomed if I were to insist on attending. Through the next few months, I declared my identity to my extended family. I broadcast a message on social media and I came out at work in May. My identity was finally trying, was finally taking some shape. Church in our area started opening up in fall and winter of 2020. I also started building a small wardrobe of clothes that were appropriate to my identity and also to church. And my spouse and I decided to attend church in person. By this point in my transition, I'd grown up my hair and accentuated my curls. I'd lost 80 pounds. I wore feminine clothes. I would worked on my voice. I felt like a completely different person. I reveled in my new personhood and I was happy to share it where appropriate. However, it felt very strange to attend the church in these clothes, talk in this voice, it almost felt taboo. I was not doing this for any sort of perverse enjoyment, just to be myself. I still felt though, as if people would have a problem with me. Entering the church for the first time in months, I was surprised because no one really wanted to engage me even to say hello. Most of the time I go to the church, I see missionaries trying to get to know new people. Other members as well often seek to say hi to someone they don't know. I don't fully know whether people could tell that this person was the quote unquote man they once knew, or if people were just trying to be extra careful in this time of COVID. One of the best things that happened during this time though was President Smith and his wife, Sister Smith. She and my wife became very good friends through the summer and would meet once a week to go for walks. It was another helpful outlet for my spouse, especially during COVID to have someone to talk to about anything. At the same time, um, both of them came, became our double dating duo. We would go on nature hikes. We opened the church and talked with each other while socially distanced. We invited them to our house and attended local outdoor restaurants. Having this relationship was a beautiful thing for both my spouse and I, and we still value this friendship outside of the church walls. When someone considers coming out as being LGBTQ+, they realize that they themselves and the people around them must go through a transition. If they consider coming out early in life or later in life, there is a constant calculus going on within their minds. 
This calculus is to literally look at all of the life that has been built around this person, the social networks, the family bonds, occupations and income streams, even the ability to have food and shelter and decide whether or not every last ounce of all of this can be placed upon an, or an altar and torched as if in an Old Testament sacrifice. Only six years ago, the church had announced restrictions for gay and lesbian couples and even the children of gay and lesbian couples. Here I was, a transgender person who is now insisting that she maintains her ceiling with her assigned female at birth wife. Both of us unquestionably entered the temple in 2003. The records are still there. We sealed our oldest two children to us and our next two children were born in the covenant. I'd rather not go into the disheartening things that have been said by the leadership that sits in Salt Lake in the various talks that they have broadcast. I'm also not here to litigate what they have said. It is not up to me to tell you what they have said is true or false. And what I do want to say is that these statements have had a chilling effect on me specifically, and I've heard others say the same. Many of those statements indicate that we are living immoral lives that would disconnect ourselves from the plan of salvation and ultimately from the kingdom of heaven. However, I was made this way. I've been introspecting for many, many years about myself. For quite a few of those years, I felt shame and pain for being who I am. I finally made the decision that I should not feel this way, even though many years of feeling this way have etched pathways in my mind that are still incredibly difficult to overcome. It was to the point that I felt that maybe LDS theology had become mythology, that the words of leadership in my own lived experience were diametrically opposed. And I was tired of denying my own lived experience. In order to truly th thrive, I had to take a very long look at the Mormon church and decided if I wanted to be fenced in by it. This has not been easy. I will freely reveal that I have attended other churches since coming out as a transgender woman. Occasionally I attended church at a United Church of Christ and the minister there knows me as a transgender woman. She was incredibly gracious as she talked to me about the steps that they have taken in order to accommodate LGBTQ plus people to help me not only feel comfortable, but to help celebrate my identity. I do not know if the Mormon church will ever be a place that they would be willing to celebrate my identity, that they would celebrate men and women who have never had to deal with gender or sexuality issues. As it is, the, me the messages that I receive from church are neutral at best and sometimes deeply challenging. I hear others talk about fulfilling time spent at the temple, that callings within the church are paramount for inclusion into the kingdom of heaven, that priesthood power can work miracles. I honestly don't have a testimony of some of these things and never felt as if I did anything of the sort when I presumed to hold such a thing. It's hard to cultivate a testimony when there are so many mixed messages, much less minefields to try to avoid. So in some ways, I've been trying to scrape what testimony I can, but I have heavenly parents who truly care for me. Like I said above, I was made this way. So the very next question becomes why? What celestial beings who love me desperately would want to send me here like this? To first put me in a place to hear about how only the narrow paths offer joy and going off of those paths means suffering and horror. To give me dysphoria, to put me in a place to hear messages about how unholy I could be how I don't deserve rights or even consideration, or that I can't even participate fully in their sacred designated church. I've had to take comfort in, of all things, the Old Testament. More than once, Heavenly Father has placed his children in the midst of huge trials. The Israelites in Egypt and the scattering of Israel by Babylon are two examples. I can't imagine that they were loved any less too. I found society and sibling bonds within the community of LDS and LDS adjacent LGBTQ plus people and allies and a vibrant community of LGBTQ plus people and allies outside the church. I care so much for you all, and I don't know how much my trials resonate with you, but you're all beautiful people. Thank you for this community. There have been times that I've felt very moved in the depths of my grief that I would love to attribute to the spirit. I'm still having issues learning to give thanks to my heavenly parents for the opportunity for me to be here. And regarding callings, I ultimately realized that if my actions and peace were guided by a hand upon high, then my calling would be radically different than many other callings in the church. I feel called to do my best to spread love in this world, to be able to let others know that they are loved and that they have a place here on this earth and that they can find their joy here, that a pair of heavenly parents can possibly hope that they find. Am I obtaining revelation? I really don't know, especially since I feel that if I were to ask this question to the leaders in Utah, that they may just tell me no. And with all that has been revealed to this point, facing the idea that I may still be an unworthy person that, who cannot participate fully in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is challenging. I have come to one last realization though. The ninth article of faith reads, we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal. And we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I'm putting a lot of faith into the final clause of the statement that many true things of the kingdom of God are yet to be revealed. We had lived in one place in Illinois for almost eight years. However, in winter 2021, our landlord politely asked us to vacate the house that he had been renting to us. We had no idea where we, would, where we would go. 
Surprisingly enough, the church offered us salvation. My spouse had reached out to the local Relief Society sisters, and one of them said that her mother-in-law was looking to leave her house. We contacted this person. Even though my spouse and I had always presented ourselves as two women and never gave any context to our relationship, she, she sold us this house in May of 2021. This meant that I now had the opportunity to do what many other transgender persons don't have. I was now able to, in a way, restart my life, to have a fresh slate in a new area outside of our previous stake. No one knew us, though I did ask President Smith to help introduce us to the bishop in our new ward. It's one thing to just show up and say that I'm Serena, but it's another thing entirely for records that carry my old name to cross somebody's desk. My spouse and I wanted to make sure that our new bishop would be as open and willing to help us as our old bishop. We were hoping for what was contained within Mosiah chapter two, the attitude of service that King Benjamin expresses when he says in verses 17 to 18. And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Behold, ye have called me your king, and if I, whom ye call your king, do labor to serve you, then ought not ye to, serve, to labor to serve one another. Before I moved, President Smith was elevated to stake president. We we're already friends with the new bishop that was called in our old ward, and we have had a good ongoing relationship with him and his wife. And then for the new ward and bishop, he has also been kind to us and has tried to help us and has treated us with care. This is where I am right now. I still have more than a couple issues to navigate being transgender in the church. I am invited fully to Relief Society presently, and on the occasions that my spouse can attend with me, we often sit together. I had told one of the other sisters in Relief Society that I'm transgender, and she expressed surprise and said to me that she hadn't the slightest idea that I was. I have issued an invitation through my bishop and Relief Society president for others in my new ward to come to this talk, and if they are here and surprised by my path, I hope that my vulnerability has not shocked or dismayed you. I am very happy to be your sister. I found peace and happiness in this role much more than I have ever felt before. I feel more ease and comfort within myself. I am happy to participate in Relief Society and have met so many people in my new ward. Thank you to those who have welcomed me. I truly honor you all. I've always wanted people to get to know Serena the person. This obviously was a difficult thing to do before I could come out of the closet because the person that I was had to guard her so closely and not let any of her slip past. The person I am now has been thrilled to bring my own light forward as Serena. In quite a few cases, though, it comes colored with the idea that Serena's first a transgender woman. <clears throat> Serena's first a person. She happens to be a transgender woman, too, but that is not the only aspect of her character. I'm glad that my local church leadership has offered me the ability to control my own narrative. I expressly invited some local people from my church so that I could tell my story. But it doesn't change the fact that there are still times that I feel uneasy about myself, even within the church walls. I'm hoping that at some point soon that I will feel that all people within the LDS church will know me well enough that as they learn that I'm transgender, they will not trust, judge me solely on being transgender and treat me with love and kindness. I'm also here to ask you to, we may not necessarily be in leadership positions, but, we, but are we in a place that we can treat all of our siblings, brothers and sisters here on earth with the same love that Jesus would? I'm a very lucky woman and that the leaders I have had on my journey in, this, in my area of this earth are loving and as accommodating as they can be. I hope that in the future, these leaders are not exceptions to the rule. And I hope that the members who make up the body of the church can demonstrate that we are all loved spirit children, no matter what challenges that we have been given by our heavenly parents before we departed to this earth. I see these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Serena, that is really beautiful. Thank you so much. For sharing your story um, and thank you for being vulnerable and i i hope now that as we go into um, our small groups that we will honor that vulnerability um, and uh, just remember that our purpose <clears throat> in being here in very large part is to learn and to understand and um and so it's it's my hope that uh, we will focus on on that, on understanding and 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 ministering. Um, so we'll. I, I think now uh, Valerie will sort of randomly subdivide us into some groups. We have some uh, facilitators. We'll talk for about fifteen minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll hear some final uh, comments from President Smith.
I, I hope that you're able to have some more learning and, and discussion in the small groups that was helpful. Um, we'd like to now um, hear from President Smith and um, I, I'll just, before I turn the time over to him, I, I, I wanna say that I'm, I'm grateful for what I heard uh, in Serena's story about um, the friendship that you've built with her and um, that in itself is such an important form of ministering. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing you share your thoughts about this process and how we can be better ministers in the church around this. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, my wife and I feel incredibly honored to be able to be here. Um, I, uh, I obviously don't speak for the church. I, I just come as a friend. Um, but with a sincere desire to, to really help build bridges. And I just want to express the utmost thanks to all of you for, for the efforts that you individually are making to, to be vulnerable, to be open, to be willing to discuss and, and guide this discussion in a Christ-like way that can help us all to grow together. Um, I am just, I, I feel like we all heard it in what Serena shared, her experiences have, it's, it's not an easy path. It is a challenging road to walk and, and but, but we can all make a difference in making it an easier road to walk. We can all play a role in, in, in making that uh, more bearable and possible. Um, I, I feel like um, communities like this help to not only help um, other, not only help us to bridge, um, bridge gaps and bridge differences and talk through uh, challenging issues, but they also help others to feel more comfortable. I have just such an incredible respect for the LGBTQ community. I, uh, both, both those who have um, come out and those who have not. And, and I've got just um, really dear friends who have, have not yet felt comfortable, that have not yet felt like they can. And, and, and to me, that is an indication that we have more work to do, um, more effort to, to just continue to, to help our society and our communities within the church and without the church to, to be uh, more loving and respectful to one another. Um, I, uh, I think for me, I, I um, well, I think I'll, I'll just continue to move forward in my thoughts just to try to not have us go over too much. I know we're sensitive to time here. Um, I, uh, I really feel, I, I, I listened to several podcasts, one that I was introduced, introduced to by Serena when she was, uh, and when she was invited to, to be um, part of the podcast. And, and I feel like I've learned a lot by participating in, um, in the different opportunities and communities that are there. One of the things, one of the messages that was shared in one that I really loved was the idea that we are all developing uh, or we are all living our own plan of salvation. Um, that, that sometimes the question will get asked, was I born this way? Um, and for me, the question is really, more a question of, am I the way God intended me to be? And the answer is absolutely, right? We were all born exactly as God intended us to be. And we are all living out our individual plan of salvation and how special it is that we each in our own story get to find our savior, Jesus Christ, that he really is the way to salvation and to exaltation and that it's through him. And and that as we um, seek to, as, as, as the writer of Hebrews um, highlights, as we seek to allow him to be the author and the finisher of our faith, as we allow him to help write our story um, and to be the finisher of our story, that truly we will find joy and peace and happiness and, and that it is all through him. Um, this is a very complex issue. I think of the discussion that 
Well, I think of all, all of Serena's comments, right? The uncertainty, uh, the fear, the, the challenges that she shared um, that I was a part of, I was a cause of in many ways. Um, I think of, of our breakout session that Valerie led where, where we, were, we were talking about how even though the, the church policy on transgender, which for me, I'm so grateful that it came out in February of 2020, uh, right before Serena and I started to meet and talk. What a blessing that was for me to have that extra guidance to help me as a church leader. And we talked with, with Valerie about how there's room for continued refinement and improvement in that process. As, again, as Serena mentioned, what a blessing to be a part of a church that believes in, in ongoing revelation, that there's much more that God has to reveal to us, his imperfect children, his imperfect church, as we as we seek to move forward together and and grow closer to our Savior, and um, and what a blessing that will be. Um, one of the things we talked about is how the policy specifically calls out that any time there is a transgender issue, we as priesthood leaders are responsible for involving the area presidency to help drive consistency in the practice. But the reality is, in, is that that's not doesn't always happen. That that uh, not everybody is blessed to have that um, be able to be the case as they work with their priesthood leaders. And and um, and I I guess I with all of that complexity, with all of the uncertainty and all of the fear, I think the message for me is really a message of of bringing it back to the kind of the basic gospel principles that we all love. Um, for me, I think of, of it as faith, hope, and charity. Um, I always find it interesting when we say faith, hope, and charity, that charity is the last on the list, but then the scriptures are so clear that it's the most important of those three. And, and that as we, I, I love, see if I can pull it up quickly, again, being sensitive to time, but um, just in Moroni chapter seven, where where we hear such a, a beautiful definition of charity. Charity suffereth long and is kind and envieth not, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity is the pure love of Christ and it, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it, it shall be well with him. Um, I just have such a strong testimony that as we focus on those basic principles of the gospel, whatever our story is, faith in our Savior Jesus Christ, um, charity um, as described in the scriptures, um, being long-suffering, patient, full of hope, that I find it very interesting that both faith and charity uh, multiple times in the scriptures are viewed as the anecdote, the antidote to fear and to uncertainty. And so as we focus on that faith and on that charity that gives us hope of a bright future, then, then the fear will disappear. The, the fear will dissipate, the uncertainty, the concerns, and we can be humbly confident, meek in who we are, and come forward and work together with those who maybe have differing views, different opinions, and, and together grow closer to our Savior. But that really it's as simple as that. Uh, faith in our Savior, hope in, in a bright future, and, and showing that love and charity to, towards all as we interact for kind of turning out, outward away from ourselves and what we, what we need to, to how can we lift and strengthen others around us together. Um, anything you'd add? Um, I, no, I, not much. I mean, I, I, for me, it's just a privilege to be um, involved and to, to see your faces and to feel the strong spirit that this group has. Um, I, I think I, you know, would like to express a voice of appreciation for your patience um, I sense patience in this group, and and I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I witness, you know, as a spouse of of a stake president I, and bishop, I, I witness the the agony sometimes that they 
the experiences leaders trying to weigh and trying trying to find time to to reach everyone as best as possible and to to not miss opportunities to to speak to people who need it um, and to and to try to make the right choices. Um, and so I just appreciate the patience that I feel in this group and in, in trying to work with leaders and trying to um, continue in your faith in Jesus Christ. And, and on a personal level, I mean, I, I appreciated um, my experience with uh, Serena's wife, Lydia. Um, you know, we, we were good friends when they were in our ward and, and we would, you know, go on weekly walks. And, um, and I just really... Um, I, I guess maybe I'm speaking to those who are who are allies and, and the challenge it is sometimes, um, particularly on the transgender um, it, uh, topic of, of switching pronouns. Um, and I really appreciated practicing um, talking with Serena's wife in and being able to, in my mind, go, okay, now I'm, I, I can use the right pronouns and I speak them out loud. And my husband and I would, would even talk. And, and it's like that, that little bit of practicing um, in a, in a, I would, you know, just in a very respectful way, just really, really helped me to, and, and yet Serena was still patient with us when we did. Yeah, I was going to say the grace that Serena showed us and over the time as we've tried as, to, as we met and, 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 and would mess up because it's, it is, you know, you, you're automatic in some of the way and um, some of the terms that you're used to saying. Um, and, and I would say ward members would feel potentially fearful that they're going to mess up. And so then they hold back and don't say anything, but but the more we as members can talk and feel comfortable um, speaking out loud um, someone's name and their pronouns, um, particularly in a transgender um, case, I, I just think that that's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of showing compassion and respect. And, but we definitely appreciate your patience and in, 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 our, in our leadership, so. I, uh, I just want to conclude by, by just sharing my faith in Jesus Christ. I am so grateful for a Savior who has atoned for each of us, that he has been so willingly, um, out of his love for us, given his life to, to make it so that we don't have to carry the burdens that are put upon us, that we can hand those over to him, that whether that's a whether that's a priesthood leader who's treated us poorly or whether it's um, within our own, the walls of our own family or, or others in the community, any hurt that we feel, um, sickness or whatever it may be, whatever it is that, that happens to us, that we can hand that over to the Savior and allow him, because of our faith in him, to carry, to carry that weight. And then, then that enables us to then have that charity towards each other. It enables us to, to be long-suffering, to, to allow, to, to forgive, and to, to be able to work forward and find ways to, to jointly come closer to our Savior. I, I know it is all through Him, and, and that, is, that the progress that we will continue to make on this issue will be because of Him, because uh, as we turn to Him and allow Him to carry that weight so that we can lovingly and kindly and patiently work together to make a better world um, is my hope and is my faith. And I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, President Smith and, and Amy, thank you so much um, for sharing. Uh, I, I can't speak for everybody else in this group, but um, the words that I've heard you speak have certainly been a balm to me. And I'm grateful to hear you talking about how important it is to learn to use pronouns and, um, and, and your core belief that the principles of the gospel apply to every single one of us, um, even if they apply in the uniqueness of our circumstances, they might apply to different circumstances in different ways, but the, the principles are the same for all of us. And those basic principles of faith, hope, and the pure love of Christ are, um, are so important. And that's what will unite us ultimately, I think, is those, those principles of the gospel. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, very, very grateful. Um, 
I also want to extend just tremendous gratitude to, to Serena, um, to BJ. Uh, Valerie is a member of the Emmaus board and um, thank you all for your vulnerability and sharing in, the, uh, in your very personal stories in this, in this topic. And um, I, I look forward to future conversations about this, but, but um, just hearing your stories and hearing your vulnerability and sharing the things that you have shared, I, I think give all of us information that we need in order to be better ministers and disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's it for this event tonight. Um, thank you all so much. We're going to close with a prayer and um, Sitsky Smealy is uh, going to give our oh, closing prayer for us. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the courage and vulnerability of those in this group and the people that have shared with us tonight. We ask a special blessing on the local leaders, the bishops and the state presidents and the area presidents that um, come across these beautiful saints. Help them to have their minds and their hearts opened and softened. And we plead to thee for more light and knowledge on these topics that we can come closer to you and to your truth and understand how you want us to proceed as a people. We ask thy blessing on all of us that we may have safety and peace in our lives. And we ask these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank you for being a part of this. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Everyone, have a good night. Good night. Yeah.